Welcome to the Real News Network in Baltimore. I'm Kim Brown. Donald Trump on Friday signed a pair of executive orders aimed at addressing what he calls bad trade deals for the United States. Is Trump really willing to play hardball with our trading partners? Well, to discuss this, we are joined with Justin Akers Chacon. He is an individual activist, writer, and an educator who lives in the San Diego Tijuana border region. He is also co author of the book titled No One is Illegal, along with Mike Davis, and he's a professor professor of Chicano history at San Diego City College. He joins us today from the West Coast. Justin, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So these executive orders were a little vague, and Trump has tasked the Commerce Department with reporting within 90 days about what factors into our trade deficit. Um, Justin, what were your thoughts about these executive orders when you read them, and is this an appropriate thing for the Commerce Department to be doing? Well, what struck me was how different in content they were from the rhetoric that Trump used during the, the campaign. Uh, and I think this reflects the fact that, at least pertaining to trade with Mexico, that the U.S. has a lot of vested interests. I should say corporate interests have a lot of vested interests in Mexico. And I think when Donald Trump talked tough on trade with Mexico, he was really coming from a place where he didn't exactly know to what extent uh, U.S. Uh, interest uh, had invested there. And I think uh, it had to recalibrate his approach there because in fact, uh, trade with Mexico is very lucrative for U.S. corporations. And I think he got the message that uh, messing with that was not the right idea. So get into that a little bit more, Justin, because Donald Trump, while he was on the campaign trail, railed heavily against these international trade deals. He vowed to pull the United States out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which he has done. And he says that NAFTA was a bad trade deal for the United States. So talk to us about the history of this trade deal, uh, the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement signed in the 90s during the Clinton administration between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. I mean, has this trade deal been bad? for the United States? Or has it been bad for U.S. corporate interests and bad for American workers as well? Well, the North American Free Trade Agreement really began uh, by a, with a drive from U.S. corporations to open up Mexico's economy. Uh, Mexico traditionally had a, a closed economy, uh, really stemming from its, uh, going back to its revolution uh, that began in 1910. And the conclusion of the revolution was a constitution that that contained various uh, clauses that were designed to protect uh, Mexico's economy from foreign control. Essentially, uh, in the 1980s, much of that, uh, those constitutional protections that were designed to uh, protect the economy from foreign domination were, were, uh, were lifted, were, were written out of, of the Constitution. And NAFTA was written into it, um, was written into the, uh, in, into the, um, into the economy. And so what that basically means is NAFTA was a series of, of requirements. Well, I should say prior to NAFTA, there was a series of requirements that were designed to open Mexico's economy. And this began really uh, in the early 1980s when uh, Mexico began to experience uh, a significant uh, debt crisis. Uh, and much of that debt was owned by the United States. And so when, uh, when Mexico began to experience this, uh, the United States, primarily through the institution of the International Monetary Fund, began to uh, issue what were called structural adjustment programs, which were, uh, in exchange for loans to deal with their debt, they were required to basically change their rules, uh, the rules within their, within their economy. And so there were over nine structural adjustment programs that were implemented through the 1980s that, in exchange for debt servicing, required Mexico to remove tariffs, uh, required Mexico to uh, basically end uh, uh, state ownership uh, of much of the uh, of much of the economic infrastructure, began to uh, reduce uh, or, or or remove currency controls, and basically we saw the opening up of Mexico's economy uh, completed in 1994 with the uh, with the signing of the North American Free Trade Agreement, which basically. Uh, was the consolidation of all of these structural adjustment programs into a treaty. 
So when we look at the after effects of the North American Free Trade Agreement some 20 plus years after its signing, I mean, who made out the best here? Did uh, the United States make out well? How did Mexico fare? What about Canada? And again, was this trade deal more beneficial to U.S. corporations than it was to U.S. workers? Because many point to the signing of this trade agreement um, as sort of the beginning of the end for the manufacturing economy in the United States. Well, yes, the 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 people who went out in NAFTA were U.S. corporations uh, by a large margin. Uh, the the transformation of the Mexican economy basically allowed U.S. corporations, U.S. capital, U.S. investors, et cetera, to operate freely uh, in Mexico. And so we've seen over the last a few decades, we've seen a, a fundamental trans transformation of the Mexican economy. Uh, about 80% of Mexico's financial sector is now owned and controlled by US based banking institutions. Uh, about 60% of its manufacturing is now controlled by US corporations. There's over 2,800 maquiladoras, which are primarily US owned assembly plants in Mexico. Uh, we go industry by industry, automotive, uh, electronics. Uh, much of the infrastructure in Mexico is actually uh, owned by U.S. corporations. And so we've seen a, a tremendous uh, amount of, of investment coming in, um, and that has uh, led to a very profitable arrangement for U.S. corporations. So uh, as of 2016, for instance, um, U.S. corporations within Mexico uh, employed about 1.3 million people and generated about $250 billion uh, in sales revenue much of what they produce came back to the United States. So this is what is, uh, what is interesting about our trade deficit is that there is a trade deficit of about $60 billion between the United States and Mexico, but much of the trade that's coming from Mexico into the United States is coming from US-based corporations or US-based facilities operating in Mexico. And furthermore, uh, about half of what they use to produce their products come from the United States. So we're not really talking about a, a, a deficit between US based, uh, between the US and Mexican based uh, corporations or Mexican, uh, Mexican based enterprises. We're really talking about a deficit <laughs> uh, that's really reflecting of the fact that US companies in Mexico are doing more business and much of that is coming back into the United States. So this is one of the, one of the contradictions of this of uh, of Trump's claim that you know that we have too big of a deficit with Mexico. Furthermore, uh, the United States is now entering into the the once protected oil industry of Mexico, and so uh, much more capital is being invested there with the intention of uh, producing more uh, oil for export. So, Justin, when we talk about what Donald Trump is proposing in terms of amending American trade policy. I mean, he has proposed a number of things, including import tariffs on Mexican goods into the United States. He's also going to be hosting uh, the Chinese premier, Xi Jinping, uh, later this week. And there's a lot of talk there. He has had many strong words for China. He has criticized China for allegedly devaluing their currency and how much of American debt that China actually holds. So of, of any of his sort of loose proposals for addressing, um, you know, America's trade issues, does any of it sound appealing to the American worker in your opinion? Well, I don't think Donald Trump has the, the American worker in mind when he's talking about getting tough on trade or, or deficits or whatever. I think he's really posturing um, in order to represent the interests of, of, of the, the investing, the investor class in the United States. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why NAFTA has sort of fallen off of the, uh, you know, off of his radar in terms of being, um, you know, a, a, a central problem for US trade. Uh, and that's perhaps why he didn't mention it in uh, specifically in his executive orders. Um, but really, I think what what what's happening here um, is um, an attempt to try to increase U.S. control or U.S. access 
in places like Mexico by posturing, by threatening to to impose taxes or threatening to to take some sort of uh, some, some sort of uh, some sort of action um, based on the false idea that the United States is losing out uh, from these measures. So, for instance, um, if we look at Mexico and and we try to understand who, who you know what is the root of the problem here, where where is the where is the trade deficit coming from, or how is it being produced? Um, it really there's no discussion of what's actually happening in the Mexican economy as a result of NAFTA. Uh, so, for instance, uh, prior to 1994, prior to NAFTA being uh, fully promulgated, uh, like I had mentioned before, before um, it was there were over uh, 700 economic activities that were closed. Uh, to to U.S. investors, or at least required restrictions on any kind of investment activity. Uh, well, since 1994, 669 e economic activities within Mexico, we've seen all restrictions lifted. We've seen all restrictions lifted, and so there has been a significant investment, um, you know, with within uh, within Mexico of, of U.S. capital and. Uh, you know, for instance, Walmart now is the largest retailer in Mexico. Um, it's a it's a significant um, banking institution as well. It's actually expanded its range of, of economic activities. Um, Exxon Mobil uh, and Chevron now operate uh, within the Gulf of Mexico. Now, as of last year, have uh, have moved into uh, Mexico's once very very protected and cherished oil industry. And it's not a coincidence that the Secretary of State is uh, himself a former CEO of ExxonMobil, Rex Tillerson. Uh, so I think I think part of the posturing here, part of the threatening behavior on, on behalf of Trump is not so much to actually address the tremendous economic displacement that's happened in, in places like Mexico as a result of this massive influx of capital and the export of, of profits which has displaced, by the way, uh, over 7 million people in Mexico since 1994, nor is it to address the, the export of jobs or you know, the, 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 the role of U.S. corporations to move uh, operations into Mexico to, to take advantage of, of cheap labor, to, to make more profit off of the, of the lower, labor, lower labor costs in Mexico. It's, it's not to address either one of those issues. It's to, it's to figure out how to Create more opportunities for for corporations to operate in Mexico and to extract more more wealth from that process. Indeed, well, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on what Donald Trump does because obviously, what he does and what he says uh, don't always match up. So today, we've been speaking with Justin Akers Jacon. He is an activist, writer, and an educator who lives uh, in the San Diego Tijuana border region, and he's also uh, the author of a recent book titled "No One Is Illegal," and he teaches Chicano history at San Diego City College. Justin, we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.